At the end of the first part, we left off with St. Therese having such a clear preference for mercy, especially in modern interpretations of her, that many may argue that it is like, unlikely that she herself would have seen her victimhood as relating complementary to one of justice. Many, in fact, would see her as bypassing justice altogether. At first glance, this quote would seem to validate that thinking. So this is, um, this is a quote uh, from St. Therese. On all sides, your merciful love is ignored, rejected. The hearts on which you would pour it out turn to creatures seeking happiness in miserable and bleeding affections instead of casting themselves into your arms, into the ineffable furnace of your infinite love. If your justice, the justice you exercise on earth, be satisfied to discharge itself on voluntary victims, how much more must your merciful love desire to enkindle souls since your mercy reaches even to the heavens. O oh, Jesus, that I may be that happy victim, consume your holocaust in the fire of divine love. To satisfy divine justice, perfect victims were necessary in times past, but the law of love has succeeded to the law of fear, and love has chosen me as a holocaust, me and a weak and imperfect creature. So, doesn't St. Teresa's path bypass justice, thus making it incompatible with the, the Holy Face devotion, which is centered on appeasing justice? Isn't her victimhood commonly understood as one of mercy, not justice, based upon love and not fear, a method by which even little souls attain great sanctity? Isn't her path to mercy contrasted to those of perfect souls who offer themselves as victims to God's justice. The next slides will show that it is more, much more likely that St. Therese was not so much bypassing justice on her path to merciful love as she was embracing it. In doing so, she offers for the faithful an understanding of the total package regarding God's love, promoting a healthy understanding of his justice and mercy as both desirable components of his love. They are married, as it were, in the practice of making reparation in Holy Face devotion. For Veronica's great act of consolation, which we are called to imitate by both St. Therese and in the Holy Face devotion, was, after all, primarily motivated by love, though it is seen through the lens of justice as well, in that it counters or repairs the injuries to Christ's face, which are, again, the manifestations of current blasphemies as revealed by Christ in the revelations surrounding the devotion. True, St. Therese had an issue with the merits of men. Acquiring personal merits was contrary to her concept of spiritual childhood. Consequently, she sought, instead of appeasing justice, to console mercy. Yet she also upheld God's justice. St. Therese's concept of spiritual childhood was like St. John of the Cross's spiritual poverty, wherein God pours his love on those who surrender themselves to him in faith and hope, who are made pure because they are stripped of all else, a sort of ordinary and everyday spiritual asceticism that leads to humility and confidence in attitude before God. Borrowing from this notion, Teresa's spirituality largely celebrates the helplessness, the demerits, so to speak, of the human soul in imitation of the simplicity and purity of a child. She consequently emphasized reliance on God's mercy rather than personal merit, such that, according to her, it was not necessary to make heroic offerings of merit in attaining sanctity. Though a great espouser of mercy, St. Therese held that all perfections of God appeared to be resplendent with love. Even God's justice seemed to her clothed in love, perhaps even more so than the other, than his other perfections. St. Therese additionally expressed that she hoped as much 
in the justice of God as in his mercy, for she held that it is because God is just that he is compassionate and merciful, implying their interdependence and that mercy flows from justice. That is, justice is the source of mercy, according to St. Therese, since justice takes into account or consideration man's weaknesses and inadequacies. St. Therese certainly de-emphasized the value of personal merits that consisted in doing or giving much in lieu of loving much. Yet at the same time, she pleaded to God's own justice. It is therefore arguably not God's justice, nor the appeasement of justice per se, that she wished to bypass. For again, she even ties God's justice with his love, but rather the way in which appeasement of justice was usually attempted, namely by the offering of one's own merits. Okay, Psalm 100, Mercy and Judgment, I will sing to thee, O Lord. Ample examples from the writing of St. Therese indicate that she was not rejecting the justice of God, but rather man's poor understanding of God's justice. St. Therese placed mercy above man's merits, but not over God's justice. She resisted the pride she felt that 19th century asceticism of ordinary mortifications engendered, according to Marie Eugene, a Carmelite known for his years of study of the little flower. In opposition, she was determined to not present any merits of her own, but only those of our Lord. She opposed the offering of one's own merits in that it involves drawing upon oneself rather than God. She writes to God, quote, All our justice is blemished. In the evening of this day, I shall appear you before you robed in your own justice and receive from your love the eternal possession of yourself. St. Therese's poems and prayers indicate that she arguably even held appeasement of God's justice as synonymous with consolation of his mercy. For she blurred the offerings of trust to mercy with the offerings of merits to justice in that she was using the merits of God rather than her own. St. Therese wanted to rely only upon God's merits in attaining sanctity. Yet that is the way of the holy based devotion. Christ's sanctity becomes that of the devotee. As discussed, this is the second meaning of St. Therese's statement that the wounded countenance of Christ is the source of all her piety. She meant not only that it offered mystical aid towards sanctity, but that it was her sanctity. The devotion is thus compatible with St. Therese's idea of spiritual childhood in that one realizes that his merits and love are nothing to that encased in the suffering face of a Savior. Like Job's friend, again from the book of Job, one understands that there is a face more worthy, more mercy invoking than his own in attempting the appeasement of God's justice. In offering Christ's love and marriage to the Father, rather than our own, in the selfless work of reparation to draw mercy for sinners, the divine likeness is remarkably stamped upon the devotee's soul as recompense for the promises of Christ in the revelations. In the spirit of St. Therese, Christ's sanctity becomes that of the devotee, the making of perfect victimhood to both mercy and justice. Now, oddly, despite the remarkable compatibility of the two spiritualities, modern hermeneutics regarding St. Therese's spirituality appear largely void of virtually any mention of the holy based devotion whatsoever, nor of her love of Sister St. Pierre, nor even of her study, her great study of the revelations given to Sister St. Pierre by Christ, 
which is perhaps one reason her approach to justice and mercy has been interpreted as so binary in recent times. Okay, there's, there's a little, these are just a few more examples of the, the influence uh, of the revelations from Christ as given to Sister St. Peter upon St. Therese. There is striking, even verbatim, repetition at times in her prayers and poetry. Her chosen name of St. Therese, of the child Jesus and the Holy Face, is, you know, that's almost always truncated, uh, but that is her full name. St. Therese always wore a relic of Sister St. Pierre and kept a Veronica veil image of the wounded face of Christ in her breviary and upon her bed curtain during her long final illness. She and her blood sisters and father were among the first to become members of the Arch Confraternity of the Holy Face. And there we can see their entries into the, into the listing there. This is all not to mention the significant influence of the miracles of Venerable DuPont, more numerous than Lord's even, which had earned DuPont the title from both Pope Blessed Pius IX as, quote, perhaps the greatest miracle worker in church history, which had taken place in her native France and during her early life. It is quite arguable, especially among the French Carmelite monasteries at the time, that the framework of the Holy Face devotion was such a celebrated given as to literally go without saying. For the devotion came from neighboring to her and had been approved for the whole world by papal brief approximately only three years prior to Therese's entry into Carmel. Moreover, within Carmel, it is quite acceptable and desirable that one build upon the spiritual heritage of the order. As mentioned and as outlined in the book, many of her prayers and poems clearly draw inspiration from the revelations surrounding the Holy Face devotion. Evidence in these writings is that she embraced the revelations and prayers given to Sister St. Pierre as the complement to her own victimhood to merciful love. <coughs> Remarkably, in fact, each seemingly had a greater promise for the other's devotion. <coughs> Sister St. Pierre might well have added to her name of the child Jesus, such as her love for Christ under this devotion. Even near her death, her devotion to the infant Jesus remained her favorite. Quote, the stable of Bethlehem is ever the home of my soul. Sister St. Pierre perfectly lived in a spiritual childhood so luminously taught by her uh, successor, St. Therese. Her candid childlike soul radiated spiritual childhood, and her characteristic virtues were those of the holy infancy. Simplicity, innocence, candor, humility, childlike docility, obedience, and gracious piety. Um, she wrote, Quote, God has reduced my soul to the state of a little child. And as mentioned, Sister St. Pierre was a master at making constant small sacrifices through her days and months, foremost in honor of the child Jesus. I didn't add that part earlier. She was simply motivated by love, always wishing to honor and console our Lord. And of course, this, this was a forerunner to St. Therese's little way. Though Sister St. Pierre's life was selflessly devoted to promotion of the Holy Face devotion, she never lost sight of the love of the child for the child Jesus and her childlike qualities. Shortly before death, Christ told Sister St. Pierre that she must become even more childlike. She was to spend the short time remaining on earth in a very close union, in an identification with the child Jesus on his mother's breast practicing the virtues of his earliest infancy. Okay, and so now we'll talk about St. Therese, uh, continuing that each seemingly had a greater fondness for the other devotions, or the other than devotion. Mother Agnes of Jesus stated, However tender was the devotion which St. Therese had for the child Jesus, 
they cannot be compared to the devotion she had for the Holy Face. And this was her blood sister as well as her sister or her mother in Carmel. Um, the, the prayer of Saint Therese uh, reads, or one of the many, Eternal Father, since thou hast given me for my inheritance the adorable face of thy divine Son, I offer that face to thee, and I beg thee, in exchange for this coin of infinite value, do not, or do not, I'm sorry, to forgive the ingratitude of souls dedicated to thee, and to pardon all poor sinners. Another of her prayers asks that God restore his image in the souls disfigured by sin. This is almost a word for word of some of the revelations given to Sister St. Pierre, and in fact is the essence of the devotion. Mother Agnes writes, it was from Sister St. Pierre that the Carmel of the Sioux derived its devotion to the Holy Face from which St. Therese first discovered the secrets hidden in the suffering face of the Savior. From that moment, the, this face, as depicted in uh, Isaiah 53, becomes, as St. Therese herself says, the source of all her piety. And finally, St. Therese's poems treat the subject of Sister St. Pierre's writings, including her doctrine on the divine maternity, indicating a thorough study of the revelations. We'll discuss divine maternity during the last hour. She, in fact, read the revelations to her novices. And, of course, Therese was known as the champion of spiritual childhood and devotion to the child Jesus. Yet, again, her favorite aspect of Christ's humanity to the very end was unequivocally his wounded countenance. During her entire hidden life at Carmel, St. Therese constantly applied herself to penetrate the secrets contained in the wounded, wounded face of Christ pondering his unspeakable mental anguish. Okay. Modern interpretations of St. Therese are missing the contribution of the life of Sister St. Peter and the divine holy face revelations given to her in the formation of St. Therese's own spirituality. A little more evidence. Reparations of the Holy Face was understood at the time as, quote, the most noble and necessary work, surely cementing uh, St. Therese's attraction to the devotion. Testimony indicates that upon entering Carmel, she was immersed in the devotion to the Holy Face, and as evidence in her prayers, clearly understood it as a most efficacious means to mercy. She credited Saint, or I'm sorry, Sister Agnes, Saint God, as the first of the suit to penetrate the mysteries of love hidden in the face of our divine spouse by introducing her to the writings of Sister Saint Pierre and held as her goal making love loved by consoling the wounded face. And again, Sister Agnes says, the devotion to the suffering face of our Savior was the leading attraction of Saint Therese. And her sister Saint uh, Celine says, uh, the holy face of our Lord was Teresa's book of imitation of Christ, from which she drew her science of love. It does not seem reasonable to assume that the spirituality of the holy face devotion, from which Saint Teresa derived her love for and lessons from the wounded countenance of Christ, was overlooked, much less consciously circumvented by Saint Teresa in forming her own spirituality. It seems more likely that she embraced the spirituality of the Holy Face devotion in the formation of her own, never seeing victimhood to merciful love as entirely distinct from reparation to the Holy Face, but rather as its complementary other half. Finally, Saint Therese and Sister Saint Pierre had a mutual understanding of the secrets of the Holy Face. These are aids to experiencing God centered upon the wounded holy face, not for any self-seeking gain, but rather to love him, to think of and hope in him alone. The contemplative life, however, always overflowing into the active care of other souls. These veiled treasures of the holy face are ultimately a means of assisting in the contemplation of God, building total dependence upon him and purity of heart. Facilitating the raison d'etre, as you all would say, of karma, union with God. So we will discuss these veiled treasures of the Holy Face after another little quick break for maybe one question.
Yes. Yes, I'm just wondering, uh, I, I didn't know about Sister Pierre's influence on St. Therese's devotion to the I thought <laughs> it was because around the time of St. Therese, the first negatives photographs of the Shroud Turin came out. And that's when it converted to the negative image. You see the face very clearly, and I believe that my sister Celine did a charcoal drawing that I had for many years. I might have been after Sister Die, but I always thought I would have to do this travel trade in it. But do um, you see any, is there, there's no conflict there, right? It's the same face, right? But I guess the difference is that the sixth station, maybe the spirituality is around the station of St. Veronica versus the travel journey, which is more. But just interesting today, more and more evidence now is confirming the. The, the, uh, the authenticity of the shroud, and you know, of course the, the, the pictures of it are spreading like crazy. So I, I can see it being a complimentary way. If you say it's complimentary, it's not at all. No, there's no problem with that. No, there, there's no there's no conflict there. Um, you know, they really. I, I, I would say the shroud of Turin is more associated with the Holy Peace devotion as revealed to Blessed Purim. And I have a, a, a little section on this in the book. Uh, pardon me, but the, you're right. Of course, you would pick up on this <laughs> that the <laughs> that the uh, the Veronica veil image is really key to this devotion because of the implied spirituality of uh, you know th that whole idea that just as in recompense for for uh, Veronica's act of consolation to Christ, he left the imprint of his face upon her veil. We, uh, in, in recompense for our acts of consolation, we are rewarded with the image of Christ upon our souls. And so that is a, a big connection. And then also, you know, all the miracles specifically associated with the Veronica Vale image. And, you know, there, there's other reasons I go into in the book. But, yes, of course you would, would figure that out. <laughs> yes? Okay, I think I bring this up later. Uh, if I don't, I will. I will bring that up. But I, I think it's in this, in this next talk or in, in one of these coming up. So, okay. Let's see. Okay. <clears throat> so Saint Thomas writes, Lord, hide us in the secret of your face. Your beauty, which you know how to veil, d discloses from me all of its mystery. So, in continuation of the complementary spiritualities of Sister St. Pierre and St. Therese, we're going to talk now about the their shared mutual understanding of the veiled treasures of the wounded face of Christ. Um, <laughs> now, there, there's Probably more. These are just ones that jumped out to me um, as I was doing research. Okay, but let me just first say the secrets of the suffering face of Christ revealed to Sister St. Pierre and the revelations surrounding the Holy Face devotion and those that St. Therese discovered, particularly within the depths of her own sorrow, not only correspond with one another but ultimately serve to cap essential insights of the great Carmelite mystical tradition. For the essence of the Carmelite spirituality is to seek and experience God, again, not for any self-seeking gain, but rather to love Him, to think of and hope in Him alone. These veiled treasures of the Holy Face are ultimately a means of assistance in the goal of contempla contemplating God, ever building upon de total dependence on Him and purity of heart. So the ones we'll talk about briefly are fulcrum of merciful love, the holy face as fulcrum of merciful love, as the greatest source of grace second to the sacraments, as means to spiritual childhood, as the most distinguished feature of Christ's sacred humanity to bring with one, so to speak, on the way to union with God, and as an efficacious object of contemplation. 
Each is a tool in striving toward living a truly divine life by embracing the suffering Savior as mediator and guide, along with our lady, ultimately promoting spiritual union with God. So the first, um, the holy, the, the wounded holy face as fulcrum of merciful love. So this is um, a description of Saint Teresa's victim poem to merciful love, again by the author Flores in the Hidden Face. Therese had meditated upon the mystery of God's demanding men to love Him and men's rejection of Him, and wondered: Suppose the human soul opened itself like a vessel, you know, like an uh, this and offer to receive the disdained love of God. Suppose a mortal heart offered a shelter to the unhoused love of God in this world. Would that not be one response to the kind God sought in souls? To be sure, the one who submitted to the wild lightnings of the divine love, yielded fearlessly and defenselessly to them, would be destroyed by them. She realized this at once. What heart could withstand the onslaught of such an excess of love? In his selfless sacrifice to save sinners, Christ revealed that suffering is love. Understanding and poignantly living this truth, St. Therese was fond of saying that love lives only on sacrifice. She wrote to her sister, Selene, Let us not believe we can love without suffering, without suffering much. That is, one may suffer without loving, but one may not love without suffering. The image she held of God as Father, in fact, became overshadowed by God as the man of sorrows, quote, his face being as though hidden, and as depicted in Isaiah 53. And she greatly preferred this image of him. Its hidden beauty delighted her and made her joyously determined to return his love with love, to embrace suffering for the love of Christ and neighbor. Suffering was central to her understanding of merciful love. It was an offering of love she could give Christ while also utilizing it as a means of atonement for sinners. Giving in this way and receiving Christ's love in place of sinners was a way to love love itself, as well as her neighbor. St. Therese's own prayer to the Holy Face states that under Christ's disfigured features, she recognizes his infinite love and is consumed with a desire to love him and make him loved by men. As Sister Saint here before her, Saint Therese recognized that the wounded holy face of Christ, as preserved on the cross veil, is nothing if not a fulcrum of merciful love. Indeed, it is the ultimate manifestation of merciful love, for it is the very figure, mirror, and image of the Divine Trinity itself, as well as the symbol of Christ's redemption. The Veronica veil image attached to the devotion is a miracle twice over, commemorating the mercy shown by Veronica to mercy itself, first as a miraculous image left by Christ on the road to Calvary, then as the object of the miracle of the Vatican, in which the veil became uh, inexplicably enlivened. Of course, it was also integral in the thousands of miracles associated with holy face devotion performed at the hands of Venerable Tupan. Veronica's veil is consequently a testament to merciful love given and received. As previously discussed, wanting only to console Christ's suffering, to let him love as he wished, St. Therese herself conceived of becoming a martyr of this onslaught of love, a victim to merciful love, and she poured this love of God unto others. Desiring love of man in the form of reparation, to console his renewed wounds of blasphemy in this era, to soothe love, which was spurned by the disdained love of blasphemers, Christ won Sister St. Peter into a victim of justice. She became a vessel to receive the justice meant for these sinners, in which it was turned to mercy for them, wherein Christ could perform his office of mediation between God's justice and mercy. As victims, both Carmelite hearts became like unto Christ, annihilated into his heart, destroyed but for that which was of him, becoming themselves vessels of reparation and love, merciful love. 
Both methods or ways to draw mercy for sinners are two sides of the same coin concerning the selfless love of God and neighbor. For reparation to the Holy Face is a, above all an act of profound love of God and neighbor, a victimhood to merciful love. Consolation and compassion toward Christ are the very hallmarks of victimhood to merciful love. We likewise imitate Veronica by consoling Christ in the Holy Face devotion. Drawing down merciful love for sinners is not so much an act of virtue as one of selfless love. St. Therese again and again took issue with the false idea, ideal of flawless perfection. Quote, it is sufficient to humble ourselves, to endure our own faults with meekness. That is true sanctity. She also emphasized what should be selflessness in acquiring sanctity. She states, quote, I have not chosen an austere life to expiate my own sins, but those of others. The Holy Face devotion likewise de-emphasizes personal virtue by offering a Christ face to the Father rather than our own. And its explicit purpose is for the drawing of graces for the conversion of the multitudes. And finally, Christ related that if souls dedicated themselves to this exercise of reparation, he would bestow upon them, quote, a kiss of love, which would be, quote, a pledge of the eternal union. Christ thus indicates that reparation of the Holy Face is above all an act of profound love, for which he is prepared to return to the generous heart a most tender and lavish devotion, a cascading of even a union with divine merciful love. Okay, so that's the second one. The wounded Holy Face as the greatest source of grace second to the sacraments. St. Therese writes, Your face is my only wealth. I ask for nothing more. Hiding myself in it unceasingly, I will resemble you, Jesus. Leave in me the divine impress of your features, filled with sweetness, and soon I'll become holy. I shall draw hearts to you. This selfless giving and receiving a merciful love performed first for love of God and second for love of neighbor, utilizing the wounded countenance of Christ as a most efficacious offering of reparation to the Father, comprises, according to the revelations given by him to Sister St. Pierre, and as mentioned earlier, the greatest source of grace second to the sacraments. The wounded face of Christ containing, as it were, the sufferings of the Savior pleases the Father immeasurably, precisely because it is the offering of Christ's love, in that love is synonymous with suffering, his being the ultimate. Though a God-centered offering in return for this giving of the love of the Son of the Father in reparation for modern sins against the rights of God, Torrents of graces are poured forth for the conversion of sinners, as was revealed to Sister St. Pierre. And great grace is reserved for devotees as well. According to the care one takes in soothing Christ's countenance, the devotee, like Veronica, receives an imprint of the divine likeness only upon his immortal soul rather than the veil. Thus, in return for the selfless cooperation of man with the power of God, as residing in Christ's wounded face, God bestows graces upon the melt of multitudes, as well as those devoted to him in this way. Man appropriately offers this reparation of love in Christ, as he is the head and the faithful uh, are the mystical body. Again, in that it is an offering of God to God, it mirrors the gift to the Father of Christ's body and blood in the holy sacrifice of the Mass. This offering of reparation in union with the Sacred Heart not only acts as its complement, but affords the Sacred Heart, according to Christ, great consolation. Consequently, a reciprocal reward of great graces is bestowed upon humanity. For again, though centered on reparation, the devotion is ultimately an offering of compassion and love for which Christ is prepared to return a most tender and lavish devotion, a cascading of grace and love. 
Okay, so I'm continuing uh, the devotion as the greatest source of grace set into the sacraments. Okay, this is taken from St. Therese's Consecration to the Holy Face. Our souls understand your language of love. We want to dry your gentle face and to console you for the forgetfulness of the wicked. O oh, face more beautiful than the lilies and roses of springtime, you are not hidden from our eyes. The tears that veil your divine love seem to us like precious diamonds, which we want to collect to buy the souls of our brothers and sisters with their infinite value. So St. Therese also understood the powerful grace hidden in the wounded face of Christ to be drawn as mercy for sinners by offering him consolation. She lived this powerful exchange, consolation for God and merciful grace for sinners within the mysterious depth of her suffering and in every detail of her life. Allowing herself to be consumed in this merciful love, she exemplified the very heart of reparation as requested in the Holy Face devotion, fittingly exhibiting an eminently Carmelite character for its God-centeredness and zeal for the conversion of sinners, made possible through this greatest source of grace second to the sacraments. Okay, so the wounded holy face as a means to spiritual childhood. Okay, this was taken from um, a biography on Sister St. Pierre, uh, but it's describing spiritual childhood of St. Therese, because that book touches on the, the two complementary uh, aspects. The soul that practices spiritual childhood leans upon God as children do on their parents. All is from God, its loving Father, nothing from self. Love is expressed by humility and boundless childlike confidence. The soul recognizes to the full its own incapacity of all goodness, its unworthiness of all grace. But just because of its own helplessness, it expects all from God. It does not try to be good or great or strong of itself. The truly loving soul is God's own child. The way of spiritual childhood of St. Therese is essential to her doctrine of perfection. It requires total dependence upon God. It is important to realize through spiritual childhood the darkness of one's littleness and brokenness, which is the object of God's mercy. If one is poor in spirit, without desires or virtues of his own, he is more suitable to them for the merciful love of God. Moreover, one needs to trust in God's promise of mercy precisely because he is imperfect and weak and sinful, leaving him only recourse to God. Yet this is not to be confused with inactivity or a complacent mediocrity. Rather, taking on the spiritual simplicity of a child requires decided fortitude, a sort of smiling everyday asceticism gleaned from mortification and purity of heart that prepare for the spiritual poverty that God himself works in the soul. Virtues still need to be tried, and love is shown by acts. But one attributes all goodness in himself to God, having placed these attributes upon him to be used when necessary, though they remain God's. One should not worry or be unsettled, therefore, for God is directing all. It is a receptiveness of God's love by trusting in him completely. Self-sufficiency and pride are the antithesis of spiritual childhood. Okay, and continuing the, the holy faces means to spiritual childhood. Okay, this is by the uh, Carmelite Marie Eugene that I mentioned earlier. One must do all in one's power, give without counting, constantly renounce oneself. In a word, prove one's love by the works in one's power. But in truth, since that is very little, it is urgent to put one's confidence in him who alone sanctifies the works and to confess oneself to be a useless servant. The mindset of littleness and poverty is also inherent in the spirituality underlying the holy face devotion. What could be a greater testament to one's imperfect, weak, and sinful nature of one's spiritual infancy than the acknowledgement and confident humility that one's own merits and love are as nothing compared to the offering of Christ's face to the Father? 
This is the way of preparation to the holy face. It is the sure bet, born of trust and meekness, that as Job's face was more pleasing to God than his friends, Christ's face is infinitely more pleasing to the Father than man's. Like St. Therese, one is assured that God will reward according to his own works rather than man's. By acknowledging one's unworthiness before God in this way, one exemplifies the object of the first three commandments, which is the proper fear of the Lord. It is the most efficacious way to the littleness of being poor in spirit, for it is by default confidence of in God and an admission of profound humility, a nothingness for which one may respect in return the fullness of limitless mercy for oneself and others, as promised in the Holy Face devotion, and an immense grace tailored for these times by God. Like St. Therese, the Holy Face devotee understands both his own helplessness in making reparation to draw graces for sinners and his need to pour forth selfless effort to entreat God's intervention. While the devotee is responsible for initiating the process, he again is assuming the merits and love of Christ, transferring, so to speak, the sanctity of Christ onto himself, such that as St. Therese proposes, one has no merits or virtues of his own, only those of God, allowing one to become united with him. It requires the spiritual rigor of both complete surrender to God in the desire to only please him, and the additionally selfless effort of making atonement for another. The Holy Face devotion then is another little way to spiritual poverty, for the devotion promotes a littleness that is tr transformed into profound spiritual strength, the strength and sanctity of God. The wounded holy face as the most distinguished feature of Christ's saint, uh, sacred humanity to bring with oneself on the way to union with God. Okay, so Teresa of Avila, the great reformer of Carmel, uh, writes, writes about, uh, I'll reference her in, in some of this. She writes, the last thing one should do is withdraw a set purpose from his greatest help and blessing, which is the most sacred humanity of our Lord Jesus Christ. For life is long, and there are many trials in it, and we need to look at Christ our pattern, so that we may bear them perfectly. The good Jesus is too good a company for us to forsake him, as is his most sacred mother. So the deeply contemplative spirituality of the great reformer of the Carmelite order, St. Teresa of Avila, is essentially Christocentric. Along with Mary as mediatrix, Jesus acts as mediator at all phases of the spiritual life, according to St. Teresa, such that for her, prayer is unthinkable without doing so with Christ. According to Marie Eugene, she observed that the transformations wrought by the redemptive blood of Christ are responsible for every spiritual renewal at all states, such that the soul has not only the right, but the duty to have recourse explicitly to Jesus Christ, allowing for a more efficacious route to union with God. Teresa composed a doctrine in which she most emphatically insists that even souls who have attained great progress in the interior life, if they lose their guide, the good Jesus will be unable to find their way. While there are many aspects of Christ's sacred humanity that one may choose to take with them, so to speak, on the way to union with God, the face of Christ is surely the most precious as the chief and most distinguishable feature in, of the sacred humanity. Following the example of St. Therese, one will find the sorrowful face of Christ to be especially efficacious as recourse during the dark night, which resembles the passion of Christ and his soul's journey to union with God. So a continuation of this is uh, concerning St. Therese, and it's, it's uh, a description by Marie Eugene again. It is through this contact which a prolonged and penetrating gaze of the soul must maintain 
that this whole draws the sorrowful face of Christ of Jesus, the science of divine love. Thus, it is not, I'm sorry, small breath for me. Thus, it is not only, it not only learns the meaning and value of the trial, but also grows in sympathy with the master and in resemblance to him. Christian perfection lies in this resemblance and in this compassion. To withdraw from this divine model in the decisive period of purification and transformation is to wander off into the byroads, sacrificing to a natural sublimation of one's faculties the realization that Christian perfection of which Jesus is the type. The living reality of Christ's wounded face was the essence of Teresa's mature spiritual life. It was not something to which she is only occasionally devoted. In taking the sorrowful face of Christ with her during her dark night of the soul, St. Therese confirms the teaching of St. Teresa of Avila and John of the Cross that the sacred humanity of Christ remains with one through the dark night as well as to union with God or in union with God. Marie Eugene describes Therese's recourse to this face. A source of life, a model to be imitated, the holy face is the great treasure of Therese, the kingdom that Jesus gave as her dowry on the day of her divine espousals, so that all its divine traits might be reproduced in her. Again, this treasure is made available for all in the holy face devotion, wherein Christ bestows the power in his face to be utilized in the conversion of sinners, as well as imprinting of its likeness on the souls of devotee allowing for its divine traits to be reproduced in all who would seriously undertake this act of repertory. Okay, and then finally, the wounded holy face as efficacious object of contemplation. St. Therese writes, O oh Jesus, your veil gaze is on heaven. Make me resemble you, Jesus. St. Therese understood that being in the presence of the face of Christ has a transformative effect. According to Marie Eugene, her contemplation consisted primarily in being with God and gazing upon Him. For her, devotion to the Holy Face meant looking at God, which was quite accurate and contemplative. She saw God through His human form because there she found the reflection of the divinity together with the traces of his suffering. Contemplation is a form of selflessly looking at God, which may be done by adoring the Holy Eucharist, by studying a likeness of Christ, or by studying him in scripture, among other ways. The selfless part is key. Therese regarded God in the best ways, not for her own fulfillment, but always to give him pleasure, to love him, for her, encounter with God gave her nothing in return, only dryness, quote, neither hot or, nor cold, as she put it. Yes, according to St. Teresa of Avila, one may claim to God by sheer faith, as did St. Therese, without experiencing anything. And this was Therese's entire life of prayer in Carmel. There was only her constant gaze. Gazing at Christ with simple faith and love, even in the driest, greatest driest, is the ultimate <laughs> element of contemplation. Its foundation and nourishment, according to Marie Eugene, it was under the silent, sorrowful face of her Savior that St. Therese formed her doctrine of merciful love. For the return glance of the Savior is transfixing and transforming. So the return gaze of the Savior, having the, uh, the power to imprint its likeness upon the souls of men. Uh, according to Father Luigi Gassani, the greatest miracle of all was that truly human gaze which revealed man to himself and was impossible to evade. Nothing is more convincing to man than a gaze which takes hold of him and recognizes what he is, which reveals man to himself. Jesus saw inside man. No one could hide in front of him, and before him the depths of conscience had no secrets. 
The ability to take hold of the heart of a man is the greatest, most pervasive miracle of all. St. John of the Cross wrote in his spiritual canticle, When you looked at me, your eyes imprinted your grace in me. Since you have looked and left me in grace and beauty, let us rejoice, beloved, and let us go forth to behold ourselves in your beauty. According to Marie Eugene, this was likely an inspiration to Therese's prayer, I am the Jesus of Therese, where she asked the child Jesus to imprint in her childish virtues and graces so that on the day of her birth into heaven, the angels and saints may recognize Christ's little bride. She also prayed, I beg you to cast your divine glance upon a great number of little souls. I beg you to choose a legion of little victims worthy of your love. The gaze of Christ is known to produce this victimhood. Christ looked from the cross, transformed St. Dismas into a soul of such great faith that St. John Chrysostom held that his faith exceeded even that of Abraham's, Moses, and Isaiah's. There was also the divine glance from Christ to St. Peter after he denied the Lord three times, which wounded him with sorrow and love, changing his cowardice and despair to fortitude and trust in God's mercy, fitting to his role of first pope. And there is the little-known letter from St. Ignatius to St. Polycarp, wherein despite Ignatius just having had the privilege of learning from Polycarp while visiting with him, Ignatius holds most precious the holy face of the man, a friend and disciple of John the Evangelist. Ignatius had looked upon the face of Polycarp, who had looked upon the face of John the Evangelist, who had looked upon the face of the Lord himself. The transfixed gaze of Christ transferred, as it were, from one to another who beheld it, produced a domino effect of almost palpable transformation in each, not unlike Moses needing to veil his face, which had become noticeably radiant after ascending Mount Sinai to converse with the Lord. To take hold of the heart of man, to transform it into the likeness of God, is surely the gaze of the veiled face of Christ in the most holy sacrament of the altar as well. Related is the revelation from Christ that his face is the seal of the divinity, having the power to imprint itself on the souls of those who apply it to their persons. This is surely nothing if not an aid to spiritual union with him. It is a desire to be like Christ on the part of a devotee and a gift of means to aid in doing so. It is like the effects of gazing at the veiled face of Christ in the most holy sacrament of the altar, only with the explicit promise that by doing so and desiring to apply this divine likeness upon oneself, that it will be done. Therese, I'm sorry, these treasures of the holy face bring full circle even more St. Therese's statement that the holy face was the source of all her piety. Christ has given his face to devotees not only as a tool to aid in their seeking of sanctity, but also as the means of taking on his own piety, his sanctity, his likeness. God has given the means to obliging souls of a most advantageous step toward union with God, with him, a grace heretofore virtually unknown. So that the next talk um, will focus on yet one more commonality between Sister St. Pierre and St. Therese, their mystical insights surrounding their respective devotion to Mary as Mother of God. And I'm not sure do I have time for any questions? Pretty much. Okay, yeah, one or two questions. Yes? Why is it really a good idea to do it? Okay, um, well, uh, for one, you get to enjoy uh, the benefits of all the members of the Conference Committee's intercession for you on your behalf, which would even include St. Therese and, and her sisters and, and her father. Um, it's, uh, it, it is the, the way which um, 
has has been laid out by Pope Leo the Thirteenth to establish the uh, the credibility of the devotion and you know to cement it for all times and places. And you know, as John pointed out, it raises it to the the level of that's like the rosary, for example, uh, canonically speaking. And uh, yes, it's it's just it's kind of like the, a, a basic way, you know, you, you say this short prayers every day, and it kind of forms the basis of, of your reparation, uh, and, and then kind of from there you might take on more and more of um, the spirituality, I guess. Um, so yeah, I mean, I guess there's a lot of advantages, but those are a few. Okay. Yes? Oh. 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 oh, wait, I'm sorry. <laughs> Okay, and the first part was the veil of Metapello, is that what you referenced, or? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I, the, which damage were you referencing? Oh, okay, yes, yeah, so, um, you know, the, the I, I think the, the, the Shroud of Turin image, you know, like, like I mentioned, it is more linked with the, the Holy Priest devotion as, as revealed to Blessed Purina, and, um, you know, it is, a, it is a recording of the sufferings of Christ, uh, you know, I guess at the moment of the resurrection, but it records the, pre, the supreme sacrifice of death. And, uh, you know, I, I think that it's, um, it, I, there's, there's a lot I go into in the book. I guess, um, you know, the, the, the difference between Veronica's Veil is uh, recording the live suffering, current, you know, kind of current recording of his, his uh, injuries. And so there, there's that difference. There's a difference in images. Uh, a lot of people, you know, rightfully, Really associate the um, the Shroud of Turin and, and Blessed Purina's devotion with the Eucharist, and it and it should be associated because that is to make reparation for offenses against the Eucharist in current times. But the other aspect is for the sins, the injuries during the Passion. So it's kind of past tense in that sense, even though it's current for uh, you know offenses against the Eucharist and the. The Holy Priest devotion, um, and, you know, revealed to Sister St. Pierre, is current offenses to the face. She also, you know, it's definitely very tied into the Eucharist. She, her whole last uh, months and days were spent almost in total um, adoration of the Eucharist, and, you know, Christ made that very clear that, that it is very tied. Uh, I think, I think that, I explain in the book, it, the other has become associated more with, with the Eucharist, but they really both are. And they're, they're both distinct, you know, the, the, I guess the big difference is the Purina one is uh, focused on the sacred humanity of Christ, and this one is more the, the Godhead it's, uh, itself, and so that's a, that's a big difference too. And so again, there's no competition, and they're both beautiful, as are all the devotions, and and uh, they're just, you know, they each kind of are like mosaics pieced together, I guess. Okay. Thank you, Mary Jane. It's beautiful.